<laughs> I want you to say, that gets my goat. That get my goat. Crazily enough, there is something that I wanted to talk about. If people don't mind a much longer episode than the 10 minutes, uh, can I, I bring this up? Okay, it's is it a, something that's going to go off on a completely different tangent? Mm-hmm. Okay. But it's something that I want to cover now because it's timely. Uh, you'll understand when I mention it. Okay. This week, over at MisfitsAudio.com, a, a special episode of Green Lantern, The Man Without Fear drops. Uh-huh. And it's something that I've meant to talk about on the show for months now, seriously. And I told you about it right after I recorded it. But if you're not familiar with that or if you haven't heard me talk about it, Green Lantern Man Without Fear is a audio drama, you know, like a radio play kind of thing about the Green Lantern comic book character. Uh, It's fan fiction kind of thing, Mm -hmm. uh, but full cast with sound effects and with music um, and not done by DC Comics, not done by Warner Brothers. It's just something that this guy, uh, Jovian Lab, I want to say his name is. You. That sounds like a space station orbiting it, Jupiter. It certainly does. This guy, I, the guy's name is Jovian Lab. It's sort of his brain child, and he's just a really big fan of Green Lantern, and he's created this audio drama. And luckily, I got to be in on the auditions for the very first episode, and I won the part of Sinestro, who is the arch enemy of Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, the great greatest of the green lanterns the green lantern of earth wait guy gardner is the greatest of the green lanterns he's got that awesome bowl cut hairdo he does have the terrible sweet, hair and he's got the terrible. sweet collar thing how do you know this with the like the leather jackety looking collar but it's green and it's like got a white stripe on it how, how did you know that because i'm a huge guy gardner fan come on guy gardner's rad See, I, this is something new. I didn't know that you even followed Green Lantern. I, I actually don't really. I just thought I'd annoy you. Oh, Go okay. Ahead. But do you have a friend that's super into Green Lantern? I, I had a friend that likes Green Lantern a lot, and he gave me several Green Lantern comics. So I've, I've read a few. And I'd heard of Guy Gardner beforehand, and he just looked like a tool. I think he's in a couple of Superman books that I had, too. Like from the time when Superman died... Guy Gardner was supposed to be... He was the Green Lantern of Earth at the time. He may have been, or I think it may have been just after he was somehow not the Green Lantern anymore, but he got a ring pop that came with special powers, and so it became that. I don't remember what the deal was. I just remember looking at him, and everybody was like, Guy Gardner, oh, he's so cool. I love Guy Gardner. Superman's boring, but Guy Gardner, he's neat. And then you're just like, wow, this is the guy they're trying to push us as the cool guy? What the heck? I I think part of the appeal of Guy Gardner is that he's really flawed. Mm -hmm. And and definitely you can argue that Superman is less interesting because he's so perfect. And there have been different interpretations of the Superman character. But the the, the man who always does everything right Mm -hmm. and is always sure of himself and can do anything, you got to admit that gets boring. And maybe not. Maybe a bunch of talented people could write a million years of Superman stories like that. But, you know, it's our weaknesses, not our strengths that make us interesting, that make us people, that make you care about people, I would think. I Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyhow, uh, Sinestro is the evil version of the Green Lantern. He has the yellow ring, which is the opposite of the green ring. Uh, The green represents willpower and the yellow ring represents fear. And he's got his Sinestro core. And anyhow, the very first episode that I did, I don't think I even had any lines. I think all I did was laugh. (laughs) And so I tried to come up with a laugh for him. Although I had auditioned already. So I, I knew how I wanted to do the voice of Sinestro. They liked that. They cast me as the role. And basically what I did was I chose like a really arrogant high-pitched, intellectual, pseudo-British voice that's like that. Mid-Atlantic? That's right, Jordan. You know, kind of thing. Uh, like <laughs> sneering, cartoony villain. Because if, you, if you've if you ever seen Sinestro, he's got a, a curly mustache type <laughs> thing and a, a little goatee, and he's got a widow's peak and, he and tw- pointed he ears. He twirls the mustache and he's got when he talks. purple skin I mean, he, he was painted to look like the devil. And I think the creator of Sinestro, and I, I can't remember 
who it was. The, the creator of Sinestro said that he patterned him on Basil Rathbone. And so if you can imagine, if if you're aware of who Basil Rathbone is... Isn't he the uh, fabulous Basil of Baker Street, <laughs> the mouth detective? I don't think so, because that was Vincent Price's voice, and Rathbone would have been long dead by then. So I, my guess is, if anything, they patterned Basil... Wait, Basil was the good guy, wasn't he? Yeah. Basil was the Sherlock Holmes character. Right. Oh, Radigan, I believe, was what they named uh, Professor Moriarty. There you go. So doing a search for Basil Rathbone, can you see Sinestro in that? You know, it's just the shape of his face. He looks like the devil. Am I wrong? Right there. Perfect. Perfect image. If you go to Wikipedia, the picture they have chosen. about this one of him as... And yeah, his most famous part was Sherlock Holmes. And that's why I thought it's called Basil. That's got to be it, right? Yeah. Anyhow, so I came up with this way of talking and and being very snide and very arrogant and ha <laughs> and yes, Hal Jordan, the greatest of the Green Lanterns kind of thing. It suited the character, I thought, because not to say that he's two dimensional, but because, you know, he was just so clearly evil, so openly evil, so irredeemably evil. You didn't have to have any humanity to his voice or anything. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a mastermind of arrogance and and fear and hate kind of thing. But this guy, Jovian Lab, he decided to do a series of stories that took place in the past that examined the backstories of characters, such as when Hal Jordan first gets the ring or the death of Abin Sur, uh, stories that... Well, I guess interested him as a writer uh, mm-hmm. of the past kind of thing. And, and he decided to come up with an origin for how Sinestro came to be. And I just assumed that this was all from the comic books that, you know, for years and years, like Marvel, they eventually ha- had a telling of the origin and then a retelling of the origin and how, how Dr. Doom became Dr. Doom You know, how Magneto came to be, things like that. That's something that Marvel excelled at. Mm -hmm. They spent almost as much time developing their villains as they did their heroes. But apparently this wasn't the case. Almost out of whole cloth, he came up with a plausible story of how somebody who was a Green Lantern and a protector of his sector of space could become corrupted and become the worst enemy of the Green Lanterns. And this week, the episode where Sinestro's fall happens airs. And of all the productions that I've ever done, where characters, even of our own stories, even doing a Mare Azteclan <laughs> dialogue, this was the most difficult performance I've ever had to do. And part of it was my own fault because I had chosen this haughty, high-pitched British accent. I mean, he had to emotionally break down. He had to fall to the dark side, so to speak, and then realize what he had done and know there was no going back. And that was so, so hard to do. I mean, part of it was on the page. Uh, This Jovian Lab guy is a really talented writer, Mm -hmm. and he should be working professionally for something like that instead of doing this thankless audio drama job where he doesn't even get a paycheck at the end of the day. I know somebody else like that. Yeah. It's just, (laughs) well, you and I, we're Americans and we have been raised to believe that hard work equals success. That if you work hard enough, you can own your own home and you can have a family and you can have wealth. That's what the American dream is. If you work hard by the sweat of your brow, you will succeed. And to do stuff for free seems to fly in the face of that. But at the same time, like the last Dupo Remo episode, some things are just worth doing if you're passionate about it. Yeah, because it's there. I mean, after all, why not? That? (laughs) There you go. That's my 2012 anthem, if you will. But what I thought when I first read this script of how Sinestro became Sinestro was, here is a guy who saw George Lucas's Star Wars prequels and said, well, that sucked. (laughs) <laughs> that was everybody that saw those, though. Well, okay, there's two parts. To <laughs> oh, thoughts. there's more. The other was, I could do this better. What if Anakin Skywalker became Darth Vader 
like this. And I asked Jovian, it's so weird to use these names, but I don't know what his real name is. I asked him if there was any truth to this, and, and it sounds like I hit the nail on the head. Because immediately I went to Wikipedia and I read the backstory of Sinestro and I went on another site and it's not there. We don't know. It's just one day he was bad. Maybe he was always bad. I think the impression was just, you know, he was a bad guy. He shouldn't have been a Green Lantern. And, and now he's, he's our enemy. Huh. Um, well, on the movie, he just puts the ring on just to try it out or whatever. And, and yeah, that's I, it. I hated that. Um, <laughs> Everybody Although did. I think Mark Strong did a good job as Sinestro. And, uh, it's okay. He's he looked, done. He looked the part and all that. Yeah. It's just, I, but here's the thing that I always say and that you always say, if you care about something and you work hard enough on it, you can make anything work. And, you know, the fall of Sinestro could have worked well in a second movie. And, and you know, that first movie, even with Ryan Reynolds miscast as he was, could have worked. And it, it just, it didn't. But on this, he came up with a, a story of somebody who wants to do good and is given enormous power. And eventually the power outweighs his desire to do good. And it begins to consume him. And when he's called on it, he strikes out and he ends up killing somebody. And once he's done that, there's no going back. I, in saying it, it sounds like what George Lucas did with Anakin Skywalker. It sounds like that. But it, it, it didn't work in episode three. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as much as people hate episode two, at least his rage against those sand people is understandable. You know what I mean? You can see A plus B plus C equals I killed a bunch of sand people and their kids. But all of the stuff in episode three, they've taken away the responsibility of Anakin Skywalker. That, you know, he was misled and he was trying to save Padme and all that. And it just, it doesn't work. There was never any choice to join the dark side. It was just, he went from zero to 60 in one line. Yeah. And with Sinestro, that he had a wife and he had a child and he had a world and he had all these responsibilities and he ultimately didn't care. He had a ring and that was more important and then it ultimately cost him everything, including that ring. It was tragic. And you look at this crazy, silly, devil-looking character, and you'd never say there's anything tragic in that. There was never meant to be anything tragic. They were books written for children in the 1960s. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But this man, I'm assuming he's a man, Jovian Lab, said, you know, I'm going to put thought and care and, and effort into this. And he's made something that I think is remarkable and I think that it's, it's, it's laudable and I wanted to talk about it so that if you have any interest at all in Green Lantern or in, you know, the things that we talk about or, or comic books or, or, or audio drama, check it out. It's called Green Lantern, The Man Without Fear. It's over at MisfitsAudio.com. At least listen to the last flashback episode because basically it just starts with Sinestra going back to protect his home world from an invasion. And that's that's really all you need. But I, anyway, I, I, I felt honored that I got to do this part. And like I said, it was so hard to do the acting on this. And I hope that I did it justice. And I don't know that I did. I mean, you can go and you can be the judge. But it's made me love this character. And it's made me like the Green Lantern universe Whereas I, I really, I didn't know much and I didn't care. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The movie wasn't good enough. And although I could be wrong. Many people may have come to the Green Lantern world or universe or comics or whatever because they liked the movie. But for me, it wasn't good enough to make me care. Mm -hmm. And this was. And so uh, I just, I, I felt like I owed it to this guy because I, I, I haven't really talked about it on the show. I've done like nine episodes and I don't really ever talk about it. But this one is the one where it's just like, wow, this guy, he has talent. And I hope somebody that notices that and says, you know, I mean, wouldn't it be just great if some executive over at Warner Brothers or DC Comics or whatever said, here's a book, here's a, you know, it might not be Green Lantern, but we'll put you on Green Lantern if this book works. Because we like what you've done on that. And, I, you know, I don't know that that's his goal. His goal might just be, I love these guys and I want to tell a story that nobody's ever told. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe he's 100% happy being an accountant. He just wants to make audio drama as a hobby. But And, you know, if that's the case, I envy the hell out of the guy. <laughs> I really do. That kind of stuff is so cool to do what you love for a living. That's got to be as much uh, the American dream as, as yeah, working yes. hard. And I remember, uh, gosh, who was it that said there, were, there was an actor who said, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And I can't remember who it was, but I loved that saying, oh my gosh, it's just, it resonated with me. And it's like, wow, wouldn't it be great to, to be paid for what I would do anyway? Mm-hmm. You know, you and said, I said, I vow to never work a day in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of that. But you and I really like to write and it just, it would be so neat if somebody recognized that we had talent or that we had promise or that we had some kind of unique voice that they would like to recompense us for. <laughs> I know. Am I using that word wrong? I don't think so. I think that it still works that way. But, uh, you know, just in this year of why not, and then this right after doing Dupal Remo, or this thankless task, <laughs> uh, I, I just, I wanted to talk about that. Did you have any questions? Or did you, you haven't listened to any of them, right? I haven't, no. And, and then that's all right. You know, audio drama is not for everybody. It's, yeah. it's really hard to write because it, it's so unnatural to have somebody in dialogue describe where they're going or what they see or what they're doing. It's so much easier to have a narrator. And that's why I like short stories better than audio drama. Just to have the narrator describe the sky and the fauna and the, the, the birds flying around and all that. Instead of a guy mentioning it to another guy who's also looking at the same thing. It always just sounds unnatural and forced and, and phony. And, but to do it really, really well, you're not going to notice that it's being done well. You're just carried along. Right. But you will story. notice if it's not done well. And yeah, that's that's something that we were talking about with the work that we do on our show with the productions. You know, sometimes there can be hours and hours of work that nobody even notices. But one... Yeah, one little me- mess up and they notice that. I know because, you know, I do that kind of stuff for a living. And very seldom after the show is over do they say, yeah, great job with that. But almost every time, hey, uh, there was this problem. What happened with that? What the is wrong with you? Get out of my sight. You know, that kind of thing. That gets my goat will be continued next time. That gets my goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license for some reason. And and you fart while we're recording too, my Goodness. You all right? I learned it by watching you. <laughs> that's probably true. You know, it's funny with the with the baby. I do that all the time. I, I wake up in the morning and I'm just like, oh, and I gotta I fart a huge one, and then I my baby's oh, they're going argh, 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 like hating life, and then finally it's like, I'm like, oh, I passed down that to him, and he's here suffering and having these gas problems, and it's all my fault. Why don't the good kid do? Or maybe it's uh, maybe that's the problem like i don't have good characteristics to pass down only stupid things like a propensity to fart <laughs> that's outtakes by the way okay back to uh do we have outtakes to that gets my go i don't know you can do whatever you want with it